Nuri, you were born in a detention center in Kashgar during the Cultural Revolution. Right. What kind of good and bad memories do you have when you grew up in Xinjiang? Um, I was born in a re-education camp uh, during the uh, height of the Cultural Revolution in Kashgar, um, in an uh, uh, ancient city where the Uyghur people consider as a cradle of Uyghur civilization. Um, because of the, uh, the extraordinarily difficult circumstances that I was brought to this world and the physical existence of that camp, that building, uh, Soviet-style building that I walked by with my mom and with my friends, uh, always reminded of the brutal environment that, uh, that my, my mother went through, uh, physical and emotional torture. Uh, to make the matter worse, during that time, my father was sent to labor camp in an area three hours away from Kashgar. So um, I, after hearing them, newly wedded couple, forcibly separated, and go through that, went through that kind of uh, a painful experience, um, affected me profoundly. So my um, concern, uh, critical view of the Chinese Communist Party started way early. Uh, of course, you cannot have a public, free conversation about your views about the regime openly, but um, I knew that something did not really settle with me from my childhood years. On a positive um, aspect, because the city at where I was born and raised is uh, very um, uh, cultural, uh, and very um, uh, communal in a sense. Um, there were plenty of activities for me as I grew up uh, to maintain my Uyghurness. Music, uh, sports activities, literature, arts, uh, food, um, and also religious ceremonies. Um, I grew up in the 1980s where um, uh, the Chinese Communist Party was not as brutal as today. Uh, so there was some room for breathe, the breathing room for Uyghurs to be able to, just to be Uyghur. Um, uh, even in my instance, as I described in the book, I was even able to participate in some religious activities, uh, following my father to attend Friday uh, prayers, um, uh, uh, public prayers at uh, major holidays. So um, I have both uh, uh, regretful memories in my early early childhood period, and also a quite happy uh, adolescence uh, years in Kashgar. You left China after college graduation. During that time, it was uh, Jiang Zemin as China's leader at the time. What did you see the major plot problems in Beijing's policy towards Uyghurs at that time? And what kind of major things has Xi Jinping done greatly that worsens the situation in Xinjiang? During my college years, um, after college, um, this was coincided with the end of the Cold War. Um, and this is the time that the Communist Party starts uh, spelling out uh, their sense of insecurity. Uh, they wanted to have um, so-called shahui winding, uh, social stability. But they missed the, uh, the key aspect of achieving that stability through uh, liberalization. Uh, leaving people alone, uh, less interference in people's lives, spiritual life, personal life, economic activities, education, then naturally will get you that stability. But Chinese Communist Party to this day does not get it. Why China spends more money on domestic security than the national defense actually explains that this government is inherently fearful of its own people, its own population. So. Um, so that's how this thing started. After the collapse of the Soviet Union, China's leadership promised it's not going to happen to us. How do you prevent this? No political upheaval. How do you prevent political upheaval? Political repression. So, uh, and now that turned into a genocidal act. So it's just backfiring one after one and, and created enormous backlash. So the, at the end of the day, ultimately, because of this um, uh, short-sighted, brutal policy initiatives and implementations by the Communist Party, uh, eventually the Chinese people on the ground will pay. Uh, 
at least uh, reputationally. Uh, now, when you talk about genocide in China, uh, every Chinese people should be concerned because that's the country that they're affiliated with. Um, and I always wonder if those reasonable, fair-minded Chinese citizens, uh, either under Jiang Zemin or Xi Jinping, uh, know that their country, their, uh, their government, is operating the largest incarceration of ethno-religious minority group since the Holocaust. Do they know that this is the government that is using technology to um, intensify, enable the ongoing genocide? Uh, do they know that alleviating somebody from poverty is not a human right? Uh, so there are a lot of things that the Chinese people don't know. And the Chinese people should be made aware of that this is a, a Communist Party is an evil regime. Uh, that it, that deserving the interest of the Chinese people in the short and the long term. For the recent secretaries in Xinjiang, from Wang Enmao, Song Hanliang, Wang Lequan, Zhang Chunxian, and Chen Quanguo, is it meaningful to differentiate one from another, and who may be like the worst secretaries? I would I would say without hesitation, uh, Chen Quanguo turned out to be the worst one. Uh, Chinese policy uh, analysts. Um, or China policy analysts, China watchers, um, experts, uh, historians, um, likening him to Adolf Eichmann, uh, uh, Hitler's um, final solution guy. So um, Chen Zhuanguo is extremely brutal. Uh, if you look at his secret of life, uh, the way that he built his career, he's a military guy, he never talks about his personal life, and deeply insecure, deeply brutal. Uh, just if you look at the way that he treats children, that in of itself shows how brutal that this person is. And, and he's single-handedly picked by uh, Xi Jinping uh, and enabled uh, and, and given all the resources, political position, in, even in the Politburo, uh, which is very unusual for provincial level official to be in. Uh, so he had given the green light, uh, authority, resources, uh, justification, uh, you name it. So he, I, would, I, I don't think that anyone surpasses him. And also, like, what about the current one, Ma Xinrei? And, and as for Ma Xinrei, he, he's essentially there for damage control. The damage is already done by Chen. Uh, the genocide is still underway. None of the policies have been reversed. Uh, the camps are still in operations. Uh, the government is still in denial uh, on a justification or in, in a business of confusing the international community by conflating something so obvious. So Ma Xinri now trying to, uh, in a, not only the damage control through uh, his, his sort of moderate look, uh, a background from the coastal city, but also he's trying to revive the Xinjiang economy. Because um, with sanctions announced by the United States government uh, targeting Xinjiang Tianshu Pingtuan, uh, the Xinjiang Con uh, Construction Protection XPCC, uh, uh, Xinjiang Production Construction Corps, uh, hurt the local economy. It's a paramilitary with uh, close to three million troops. So uh, Ma Xunri has a very, very specific agenda, which which I believe, based on what I read, is to control the narrative, uh, project a uh, less repressive image of the le of a leadership, and also try to help uh, the local economy. In your book, you also talk about some of the technologies the Chinese government used in uh, those detention yeah. camps right now. Yeah. And some of the technologies are stolen from the Silicon Valley. Could yeah. you tell us more about yeah. that? You know, it's in in inevitable. Uh, the Chinese people are uh, hardworking, um, innovative, um, uh, in many aspects and technology sphere forward-looking. So it's inevitable that China have an advanced technology. But the question is, is that technology making lives better, more secure, more prosperous? Or is that, te that technology uh, enabling the government to be more intrusive? Um, and I don't think that any Chinese citizen, um, uh, in a broader sense, like the Chinese government monitoring uh, espousal activities in their bedrooms, espousal communications in the bedroom, uh, family communications in the bedroom, because every single mobile device in China is a listening device now. 
So the China is the new Saudi Arabia for personal data. In the case of Uyghurs, uh, it's more than just a surveillance. They're using the uh, personal data to identify those who need to go to the concentration camp. Uh, IJOP is the acronym for Integrated Joint Operating Platform. Uh, in Chinese, it's Yiti Hua Xitong. Has been used to collect personal data and uh, use machine to order who should be sent to the camp for re education. So, if this does not concern us in the United States, if it does not concern any ordinary Chinese in China, then I think we have a problem. Uh, this should concern every one of us. Technology is supposed to foster your life. Uh, technology, I, I live in a technology. Uh, I use, I take advantage of and benefit from technology, but I'm equally uh, concerned and disturbed that uh, the engineers in Silicon Valley, venture capitalists in Silicon Valley, hedge funds in, in uh, New York, still funding the Chinese technology. Silicon Valley is still supporting the Chinese high tech. Uh, that is directly connected to the central government. Central government is essentially uh, central uh, Chinese Communist Party. This is not a normal government. This is a one-party Communist Party rule country. Uh, it's economic policies, uh, tech policies, the national defense, uh, law enforcement, the legal, everything is set. Even social media messaging is set by the Communist Party. So people need to know this is not, not about um, uh, calling China out. This is not about uh, reporting on something that already become a uh, part of the Chinese uh, uh, people's lives. This is about the future. Do you really want to have Chinese f uh, form of governance and social control, people control, or you want to have a more liberal liberalized uh, society that respects your privacy? China's brutal oppression in the labor camps in Xinjiang has caught the attention of the whole world. What could be done to get more details about the brutalities in Xinjiang? The, the international community is still um, uh, concerned, uh, both in governmental level, in the societal level, um, in the business level, uh, potential retaliation. I think that's the wrong approach. Um, China will not have a healthy, mutually respectful relationship uh, as long as it continues to genocide. Uh, it's the end of the story. Anyone in Beijing uh, advising Xi Jinping or advising senior policymakers are not being honest. The fact that the international community turned against China, and I never seen, I don't know if you have uh, in my recent memory, as isolated as, as China has been in the international community. And they do care how it's perceived, how it's portrayed. And they do care when their economic interest is hurt. So because of this disastrous policies, committing genocide in the broad daylight, on the world's watch, committing crimes against humanity, with in ill intention to destroy this nation, uh, this proud people, ethno-religious group, now China puts itself in a box. It, can you imagine that if, if these things didn't happen, uh, where the China could be today? What is Chinese economy would look like, and how how Chinese economy would look like. So they are, they have managed to shoot on their own foot. Uh, this is their own problem. This is own sense of insecurity imposed on other people, thinking that they could get away with it with impunity. World is changing. The Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act is implemented starting this June. How do you see the effect of the act preventing the forced labor in Xinjiang? The Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act, arguably the most important thing that the U.S. Congress has done uh, since China joined the WTO to uh, address some of the lingering issues. Um, slave labor products coming to the United States is already banned. Uh, there is a, uh, a certain measures put in place, but because of the scope and severity of the issues that we're dealing with, specifically on forced labor practice in China, uh, because of the labor shortage, uh, it, it has become such a huge issue affecting everybody's life, and even in the United States and worldwide. So this bill will address this. And then the brilliance of this bill is to push the responsibility to the businesses essentially saying that everything that you can bring into the United States are made by or made with 
uh, forced labor. Uh, we will not let you import unless you prove otherwise. So instead of governments doing investigation, putting a lot of resources, this is on the businesses, rightfully. Uh, and also this will make uh, some business practices difficult. It may affect um, the supply chain because uh, American people were addicted, addicted to cheap consumer products uh, that they find in Costco, Target, and Walmart. Uh, they may, may no longer be the case. Uh, uh, you know, in, there's, a, there's an ethical, ethical way to do business, and money is not everything. There's a human lives, and uh, anyone should or even feel comfortable with modern-day slavery should be, shame of, shame, should be shamed of himself or herself. Um, we should despise anyone being enslaved or performed forced labor against their will. Here at home, around the world, China, no matter where it finds, we should all condemn it. It's, it's, inc it's cruel, inhumane. China is not the only place that they can make those products. They can go to uh, a country that does not enslave fellow human beings. We already have a supply chain problem. Look, remember the uh, ventilator problem early on in the um, uh, early parts of the pandemic? The Americans did not make enough ventilators. <laughs> it was imported from China. And guess what? A lot of people died. So American people need to make things at home. And American people are capable of making things at home. And China should not be the only country for assembly lines. There are a lot of places in the developing world would be happy to host those companies.